Let us pray. May your word be proclaimed in scripture and in song, in prayer and in fellowship. Feed us the vines of your vineyard, O God, so that we might grow to become fruitful bearers of your good news. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading from the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you're reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer, so he does not open its, his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak, starting with this scripture, and he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What is, to pre what is preventing me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Our second scripture comes from John chapter 15, verses one through eight. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's not a casket. Those are the first words I need to share with you. The image on the front of the bulletin is not a casket. It is a poorly taken and poorly cropped picture that I took earlier this week. It was entirely my choice and I apologize, but it is not a casket. 
This is what I had the, the children look at earlier. It is a picture from the front of the baptismal font, as is the large picture in the bulletin, in this inside of your bulletin. And then that border in the center lower part of the bulletin is actually the border from the balcony, uh, just at the bottom there, right in the middle. This image is that of the vine and the branches of grapes, a fruit of the vine. And these images uh, are found throughout scripture, honestly, they're found in the Old Testament, found in the New Testament, uh, found within churches all around the world. And there's lots of reasons for that too, right? There's, uh, it's, it's imagery that has transcended the 2,000 years and 6,000 miles from where they were initially spoken and written. Uh, they tie to one of our sacraments, which is always helpful. Grapes, grape juice, Lord's Supper, good to have nearby. It's something natural. We have like to have green things in church spaces, right? We're also conscious of our creation. So what do we have to learn from a grapevine? And the answer is plenty. Jesus begins by saying, I am. And that is certainly a play on the ancient name of God, Yahweh. Uh, but that's another sermon for another day. I am the vine. And the father is the vine grower. Later, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. So to start, unlike many parables that Jesus uses and other metaphors, we already know who is what, what we are and how we are playing a role in this metaphor, in this parable, in this imagery. And that's very helpful because uh, there are many that we have to dance and guess around. So. Jesus is the vine and we are the branches. Well, what kind of vine are we? What kind of vine are we? Jesus is pretty clear on this one too. The vine's purpose is to bear fruit. And there are, there are lots of kinds of vines, right? We've got the, that ivy that you know, decorates or damages buildings, depending on your perspective. Uh, we've got fruit vines, things that we eat things off of, like grapes and uh, peas, frankly, are also vines, right? And then you've got, down in the south, you've got that kudzu stuff, that stuff that slowly eats away at anything, and well, slowly, very quickly, frankly. It's kind of scary, it will destroy anything. Jesus is very clear. We are to be fruitful, fruitful branches on a fruitful vine. Wonderful. What does that make of those that do not bear fruit? Their purpose is different. They become firewood. So, that's kind of scary, isn't it? A branch cannot survive on its own, says Jesus, so there are, there's a couple of ways that we can end up as firewood. It's if we're not producing fruit and if we're separated from the church, from, from God, from Christ, rather. We need to bear fruit. But if we aren't bearing fruit, if we are, sorry, if we aren't bearing fruit, we need to be bearing fruit. Do we need to worry about this? Jesus says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear fruit. You will bear much fruit. So our question does not need to be if we are bearing fruit. That will certainly happen if we are abiding in Christ. If we are living as Christ is a part of us and if we are a part of Christ, our focus must be on abiding with Christ, therefore. So what is this abiding, abiding with Christ? If we stick with our metaphor, Basic biology tells us that branches cannot survive on their own. They need some sort of root system. Christ is that root system, that well-supplied, well-fertilized, has a great source of water, carefully prepared, adequate to sustain the branches that will be put upon it. Like many other plants, vines often can be grafted into one another. 
grapevines, like many fruit trees and plants, have a, a multitude of varieties, and, and every variety is slightly better at living in a certain condition. Some are better in rocky soils, some are better in sandy soils, some need lots of sun, some need lots of water, within reason, of course, but all of these different vines have different strengths. But you can graft one of these plants onto another. So if you have a plant that is very good in the soil that you have, but it produces some pretty rotten fruit, the trick is you can cut off the fruit-bearing part of the plant and graft in plants that have better tasting fruit. Provided, of course, it's not the nutrients or the ground that the soil that the plant is in that's making the fruit taste bad. There's all these little factors. This is why winemaking is so uh, tricky and fun. But the application for us today, we are not in a winemaking class, are we? We are here in church. So the application for us today is we can be grafted into that great root system. Christ is the one that can sustain us. And so we can be grafted, we can be added and put onto the root system of Christ. Our job is not to bear the fruit, though it is a byproduct of abiding in that root system, abiding in Christ. When Jesus talked about being the true vine, this wasn't a new image for the people that would have heard him. The Jewish people that would have heard him speaking would have immediately thought of the writings of Isaiah. Isaiah 5 talks about uh, God being a, a winemaker, a vineyard planter, a vine caregiver. Uh, God had created a vineyard and planted vines, the people of Israel. And Israel's, or Isaiah's prophecy was that God was not pleased with the fruit of Israel, and so God uprooted that vine, leaving behind an empty vineyard. Jesus was, in saying he was the true vine, was saying that he was the one replacing the people of Israel. Psalm 80 also talks about vines and vineyards, about the vine being delivered out of Egypt. And the people of Israel believed that that was them. But Jesus as an infant, fled to Egypt with his family, obviously, uh, and, and returned from Egypt. And so there's prophecy that was filled in that. And, and so with Jesus saying, I am the vine, he was making a bold statement. Jesus is also saying, and, and subtly here, but this was latched onto later, Jesus is also saying that all branches are being grafted into me. I am the true vine, I'm that root system. You can be grafted into the root system that I am. Not just the Jewish people. This was one of those doors that Jesus was opening and saying, this is for all people, Gentiles, all of us, people who were not connected to the, true, to the vine that was can be grafted into me as well. Which is good, because Manischewitz is good and all, but we do like other vines and other grapes as well. So the purpose of the vine. The purpose of the vine is to bear fruit. If you are abiding in Christ, you will bear fruit. You will bear much fruit, it says. Jesus says. And then Jesus says, those who bear fruit, will be pruned, pruned to increase their fruitfulness. Now, if you don't, if you're not familiar with gardening terms, yes, pruning is that cutting. Pruning is the cutting back of a plant. Doesn't sound fun. Pruning is when you cut off what is unnecessary on a plant. Uh, if you cut back the extra branches, the things that will get in the way, the sick or diseased branches, it will permit the others, the remaining ones, to be more fruitful. In some cases, pruning means cutting back nearly everything, leaving one or two stems. 
it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense unless you know how plants work, right? More branches, more leaves, more opportunities for fruit. That's a good thing, one might infer. But actually what that means is uh, fruit is a, an energy intensive activity for a plant, for a tree, for a vine. And so if there are too many opportunities to produce fruit, that plant can put too much energy into that, creating, you, know, you might get mediocre fruit, you might get too much mediocre fruit, but then also the plant does not take the time and energy to build itself up. It does not strengthen the plant, it does not put out as many leaves, it does not get as much energy that way. So by pruning it back, you then allow this plant to have the energy to strengthen itself so it can produce fruit for more seasons, strengthen itself, but also produce some good crop. It may seem counterintuitive, counter but pruning makes things taste better, makes things last longer, creates a more robust plant. And so it is with God and God's vineyard. Christ is that main trunk, that vine, that established vine that produces and seeks out and pulls all the nutrients and water needed for the branches. We are the branches. We need to be pruned, which isn't exactly the most fun process, as you may guess. When we are pruned, when we go through trials, when we go through troubles, when we experience that pain that comes with life, then we are strengthened. Then we find ways of growing in ways that we may not have expected. A strong plant, a strong plant is better than one that is bigger, broader, for us to be fruitful, we need to abide in Christ, but be prepared because that pruning is coming. And so what does this look like? This is where our Acts passage comes into play. And the, the PW group, the, the women's Bible group, uh, Bible study group, studied this passage from Acts uh, several weeks ago. So find one of them if you want to have a great discussion about all of this. But I'm going to skim over just some of the details in this passage from Acts. It highlights for us what is uh, a parallel in this pruning process. The passage begins in Acts after the apostles have begun preaching and baptizing in Christ's name all around Jerusalem. Thousands were joining this group of Christians, the church. They had so many people in the church, they were struggling to keep up with everything that needed to be done, with caring for the poor amongst them, for caring for the widows and the orphans. And the apostles needed help, and so they found a handful of leaders in the crowd and their church community and appointed them to be deacons. It's the first board of deacons. They were doing all this work. It was all fine and good. Well, relatively speaking, Jewish leaders were not big fans, of course. And so at one point they got fed up and they appointed one of their own. His name was Saul, later would become Paul. Uh, but before he saw the light, literally, he was the one who led the persecution against these Christians. Christians began to get thrown in prison. They were being killed. And so the church dispersed. They ran away from the persecution. They became refugees. They fled the violence. One of those refugees, one of those new deacons, in fact, was named Philip. And ultimately, he fled down to Samaria and then was told by an angel to go toward Gaza. And as he was walking down the road, he saw a chariot. Now, they're on a wilderness road, which is, as it sounds, a wilderness road. It's not exactly the most kept road. It's probably bumpy. It's not uh, cleared entirely. And there's a chariot. This wasn't just some chariot being pulled by a horse. 
This had a driver, someone inside the chariot. This was a fancy chariot. Philip sees this chariot and then is told by the angel, go and run up alongside it. Wilderness road, so they can't be going too fast, but Philip is told to nonetheless run down the road alongside this chariot, poke his head in the cabin and say, hey, what you reading? Philip was in no place or space to be doing this kind of thing. Philip was experiencing persecution. His friends were being killed and thrown in prison. He had just fled home and was now being told to chase a fancy car. He likely had, the eunuch likely had security. This person who was driving was probably someone meant to protect him because he, this man inside the chariot was meant to be, or was uh, rather, he was the treasurer for the queen of Ethiopia. He had a scroll of the prophet Isaiah in his cabin with him. For context, today, if a temple, want, a, a Jewish temple wanted to buy a set of scrolls for their temple, a new temple, for example, that would be about $40,000. So just, just to kind of wrap your head around things, he had disposable income for some extra scrolls, as one does, some light reading on the ride home to Africa. Uh, <laughs> this man was also, he was a eunuch, which, uh, for lack of, it's hard to describe. He, so a eunuch is someone who was castrated, usually as a child, um, but was therefore kind of sitting in this realm of not being male, but not being female, was this person. In his case, in this eunuch's case, I shouldn't say his, in this eunuch's case, uh, they were part of the queen's ensemble, the, the group of people that kept her belongings and her work, her money. So he was very educated. He was able to read the scroll. He was able to speak another language, clearly. He was someone who did not fit in the society where Philip was from. He would not have been allowed to be in the temple, yet he was in Jerusalem to worship. Everything about this person was foreign, was likely foreign to Philip. The wealth, he was from Ethiopia, so he was a darker, a much darker skin complexion than uh, Philip, almost certainly. Everything about him would have been different. Philip is trying to keep his life, and God has called him to come and speak to this eunuch. What follows is, he reads, he jumps in, jumps in the chariot as one does, uh, reads the scripture with him, enlightens him to what, who Jesus was and what Jesus did. They pass some water, he baptizes the eunuch. And tradition in the Ethiopia as, as, is that this eunuch went back to Ethiopia and carried that word, carried the word of God, the good news, to the people of Ethiopia. And so in doing, in being obedient, to God's call, in being a part of what God has called him to do, he fulfilled this teaching to the eunuch and in turn bear, bore much fruit, much fruit. The African church traces itself back, most of the African church based in, in the Ethiopia region would trace themselves back to this encounter. All this is to say, we are branches, we are grafted into the vine of Christ. Pruning is not fun. Pruning may feel unnecessary, may not make sense. Our life circumstances may not be what we think they need to be in order to be fruitful. But there's purpose, there's opportunity, and in obedience, to that pruning, the fruitfulness will increase. And finally, remember that what the purpose of fruit is. Fruit is meant to spread seeds, it's meant to be eaten, it's meant to be used and, and added to meals. In order for fruit to do what it is meant to do, 
there's sacrifice. There's sacrifice involved. New life comes from that sacrifice. So the math of grapes, as it is, may not feel logical. It's an equation of persistent subtraction in order to gain. It's a journey marked with factorial outside influences. But knowing that it is not our own acts necessarily, it is not our own doing that will increase our fruitfulness, it is the work of God in our lives. It is in our abiding with Christ that fruitfulness will come. One grape at a time. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.